This is a Sports Catastrophe production. Hey there, hello there, hello there. It's Jeff Cutter Gun, and welcome you to another Sports Catastrophe on this day. And on this day, May 24th, almost 30 years ago, 29 years ago, to be honest, in 1992, <clears throat> one of the greatest Indy 500s of all time happened. I know there's a lot to be said for the best Indy 500 ever and all that. But to me, this was one of the all-time classics and all that, despite the fact that I was only seven years old when this happened. So the 1992 Indy 500 happened in this event. It was, it wasn't like, it, unlike any other turn, uh, thing in history. It was basically full of big mistakes and all that. However, practice would be basic. Practicing for the Indy 500 would and qualifying for the Indy 500 would be terrible and all that. There were a lot of crashes. Well, 13 of the 33 cars were were eliminated in crashes during the race, and many practice wins. Nelson PK actually practiced for the Indy 500 and suffered leg injuries. Poncho Carter and Hiro Matsushita got broken bones, but Rookie Jovi Marcello was fatally injured after practice crash May 15th. Rick Mears crashed during practice and during the race, and Jeff Andretti suffered massive injuries to himself. Following the 92 race, sweeping changes were made for safety. And the 92 race signaled the final race for several indie legends like AJ Foyt, the fur, AJ Foyt, Rick Mears, Tom Sneva, and Jordan. I mean, and Gordon John Cock. So basically, yeah. I mean, when you look at those racers, AJ Floyd, the first guy to win four Indy 500s, Rick Mears, who had several great races in the 80s, Tom Sneva was good, and Gordon John Cock, who won 1982 Indy 500 in the closest finish ever at that time, 1982. So basically, a lot of people were amazing and all that. So the Indy 500 had a lot of things and all that. There were some rule changes and all that. New pit rules were implemented. At the onset of a caution flight, the pit road was immediately closed and cars were required to pack up behind the pace car at first. The next time around, then the pits could open for all competitors. Ah, that's not a bad idea. So basically, there were a lot of problems at practice and all that. There were a lot of spins and crashes. But Nelson PK basically took the biggest thing and all that. So basically, a lot of practices happened. And then May 15th, Jovi Marcello died. A fatal crash. He was the first driver to die at any. Speedway since Gordon Smiley, 1982. That was before. That was practiced before the 82. Thing. So the starting grid had some people there. The leader was Roberto Guerrero, who was Colombian and actually was a pretty decent. Driver, but basically, you did gave him a lot of fits. Uh, Eddie Cheever started second. Mario Andrade started third, which is amazing because Mario Andrade basically, you know, was an icon. Other other notable racers were Ari Leinig, Michael Andretti, Scott Brayton, who would soon win a couple of straight poles before his untimely death in '96. Danny Sullivan, Rick Mears, Bobby Rahal, Edwardson Fittipaldi, Al Unser Jr. Well, Unser Jr. started twelfth officially. Um. Paul Tracy, Alan Sir Sr., A.J. Floyd, the four-time champion, but he lives here. The only woman in the race, Lynn St. James, Jimmy Fasser, Jordan, uh, Gordon, John Cox did it again, Tom Sneva, and Scott Goodyear. Now, Mike Groff actually qualified the, for 26 and turned out Carl to Scott Goodyear, but because of that, Goodyear had to start at the back of the pack. Other famous people 
well, who failed to qualify? Well, Kenji Momota of Japan was the one who got bumped on bump day. No Tony Bennett Housen Jr., son of a famous IndyCar driver. Johnny Rutherford was supposed to win, but he was too slow. Poncho Carter crashed and couldn't do it. That was a PK good. A drove before solo couldn't. You know why. So anyway, it was huge and all that. Unfortunately, a cold front hit Indianapolis during the race. And the temperatures on race day was 9 Celsius or 48 Fahrenheit. And the wind was huge because the wind chill made it minus 2 Celsius. So it's time for the pace car and all that. And on the second parade lap, Roberto Guerrero, who was the pole sitter, got in his machine to warm up the tires, but his back end whipped and he ran into the wall. His suspension was damaged so badly that he couldn't continue. And it was one of the mo most shocking moments of all time. Is that Roberto Guerrero was out of the race before it even started. Ironically, yesterday during the Monaco Grand Prix, which was won by Max Verstappen, Stappen, spoiler, the we, the man who the pole sitter was Charles Leclerc from Monaco, and he had a problem with his Ferrari suspension problems. He couldn't even do the race. So how ironic was that it happened? So basically, yeah, Roberto Guerrero couldn't even race. The pole sitter couldn't even race. That was weird. So basically, Eddie Cheever was technically allowed to lead the field to the green flag because obviously he was second. So there was a race going on. Multiple crashes happened. And all that. Crashes would ruin, crashes would ruin a lot of people. Roberto Guerrero went out of the parade lap. Tom Sneva went out on lap 11. Philippe Gosh went out lap 62. Stan Fox went out 64, lap 64. Rick Mears went out crashing with Jim Crawford in 75. Emerson Fittipaldi crashed on lap 76. Mario Andretti crashed lap 79. Jimmy Fasser crashed lap 95. There were a lot of crashes. In fact, only 12 racers actually finished the race without crashing all that, which was huge. So, the, so as I said, there were 12 racers who actually fit, who actually um, finished the race without crashing out of 33 cars. That's amazing. 12 out of 33. Dominic Dobson, Lindsay James, John Paul Jr., AJ Foyt, John Andretti, Raul Balzer, Bobby Rahal, Danny Sullivan, Eddie Cheever, Alan Sir Sr., why people forget Alan Sir Sr. actually took third. But the two men at the top were Alan Sir Jr. and Scott Goodyear. It was a race. It was one of the biggest races of all time. With four laps to go, Unser held a 0.3 second lead on Goodyear, the Canadian. And it was huge. On the final turn, Unser Jr. got loose and he had to back off the accelerator slightly, and Goodyear pounced on the opportunity to close in. He tried to zigzag down the straightaway, but he missed. And Alan Jr., by 0 0.043 seconds, beat him. The closest finish in Indy 500 history to this day. It's like, can you believe it? 0.04 seconds. That is not, e that's not feasible, but yeah. So Alan Jr. snipped past A. Cheever for third place. Which was amazing, all that. It was a good race. Alan Jr. shockingly did it. It was amazing, and all that. Alan Jr. did pretty good for himself. There was a lot of legacies going on. Yep, a lot of legacies happened. Scott Goodyear's charged from 33rd and last because of the driver switch to second place. It was the second time a driver did so in Indian history. Tom Steven went 33rd to 2nd in 1980. The winning margin was actually deemed to be closer than published. 
it was unofficially 0 0.03 seconds. But still close enough. However, the 93 Indy 500 would be overshadowed by the that finish was overshadowed by the crashes and all that. 13 cautions for 85 laps. Several drivers had to spend time in hospital, and when IndyCar went to Detroit, they needed substitute drivers. In the aftermath of the crash during the race, Rick Mears only had a partial schedule for the remainder of the 92 season and basically retired from driving. A.J. Foyt retired as well. The Andretti's family's misfortune during the race actually was part of the Andretti curse. Jeff Andretti's leg injuries, Mario's foot injuries, and Michael's late en race engine failure amounted to one of the worst examples of bad luck the family ever experienced at Indy. Michael wouldn't even come back till 1990 for a couple of years. Well, he was in Formula 1 in 93, so he couldn't take part. 94 he didn't come by, but he came back in 95. And Jeff wouldn't even qualify all that. But the track would be reconfigured for safety reasons. The apron at the bottom of the track was removed and replaced with a new warm-up lane. And the outside retaining wall was also replaced. The race was held on May 24th, only the third time in any history the race had fallen on that date. The previous winners were Bobby Unser and Al Unser Sr., which is ironic because all three times that it was raced on May 24th up to that point, and Unser had won it. That was weird. Al Unser Sr., Bobby Unser, and Al Jr. Wow. Michael Andretti led 160 laps but failed to win the race, which was the most laps by a non-winner since Mario in 1987, his father. Roberto Guerrero was the third pole winner to finish last, as Cliff Woodbury in 1929 and Pancho Carter in 1985 were the previous two. I thought Danny Sullivan was the guy in 85 who won the poll. I guess not. Eddie Cheever was the first number two starter to complete the race since Mario Andretti in 1969. Wow, so it took 23 years. In the 23 years, the second starting position was having a curse. No winners and cars were frequently dropping out. And ironically, 12 of those 22 races, the one or three, the, the pole center or the number three guy won. Wow, that is amazing. Eddie Cheever actually completed it. Um, a record 10 former winners were in the race. A.J. Floyd, Alan Sir Sr., Rick Mears, Gordon John Cock, Mario Andretti, Tom Sneaver, Danny Sullivan, Bobby Ray Hill, Emerson, Fred Foley, and Aaron Lundike. This was amazing about that. Of course, ABC shown it as Paul Page was the Playboy Play announcer with Bobby Unser and Sam Posey in the thing. The 92 broadcast actually missed the finish of the race. I didn't know that. As Unser Jr. held out Scott Gear during the push line, the director kept to a camera angle over the flag stand, and viewers were not able to see the leaders after crossing the line until replay was shown. Really, I didn't know. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because right at the line, and then they made a cut to a camera angle. So that was amusing and all that. So, yeah, the 92 Indy 500 it was iconic for having the pole sitter actually not finish the race, or even start the race for that matter. And then basically, I learned to Junior's snipping of Scott Goodyear at the line. Unfortunately for Scott Goodyear, this, would be, this wouldn't be the last time that he suffered a massive Indy 500 loss. 95, when he thought he won the Indy 500, he was black flagged because he had passed the pace car before the green flag came out. He needed a run on Jacques Villeneuve. Bad news for Goodyear, he was DQ'd, and Villeneuve, the 97 F1 champion, and Canadian, if, you, if I may say so myself, won the race. So that was good news for Canada, I guess. Anyway, I'm Jeff Diamond. I do.